is uh, controlling the false discovery rates, or FDR. And here, we want a different guarantee. This is not about family-wise error rate anymore. Uh, and the procedure that we have for it is uh, called benjamini hockberg procedure. So, so with false discovery rates, false discovery rate is uh, equal to the expected value of false rejections over total rejections. So we are still you know, conducting M hypothesis tests. Uh, and then you know, we, we decide to reject or not reject. And whether or not a rejection is false rejection or true rejection depends on the ground truth, which we don't have access to usually, right? Uh, but in terms of the you know, terminology that we are more familiar with, this is actually um, one minus precision. So this would be, so false rejections, well, when we reject something, it is as if we're classifying it as positive, as discovery. So it is false positive divided by total rejections. So it would be uh, false positive and true positive. So you can now see why this is uh, one minus precision. Because precision is true positive over the same denominator. Uh, so for, we want to control this, fam this false discovery rate uh, by some threshold. So in your textbook, it uses Q. But actually, to, to make it easier, I'm going to continue using alpha. Uh, so let's say we want to control this to the limit alpha. But usually, the alpha that we have for false, false discovery rate is not 5%. Sometimes an alpha of 20% or 10% is also fine. So here, uh, we are being you know, less, less conservative because the, uh, you know, the, uh, the purpose of these tests are different. So false discovery rate is suitable for cases where m is large. So actually, this is more relevant to uh, data science situations or the example I had with, uh, with Bill Co sponsorship where M is like thousands or tens of thousands and so on. So when M is large, this idea of family-wise error rate, which is probability of not having any type one error is just too much to ask because we are running, let's say 20,000 tests. Now, just considering the probability of not making any type one error, that's you know, a, bit, a bit too much. Maybe we just don't want too many false discoveries. So for example, let's say uh, we're testing um, we're testing 20,000 drug candidates. You know, some candidates, I guess, from like biology and medicine, you know, and, 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 and uh, pharmaceutical sciences, right? Uh, we're testing these to find a smaller set of quote unquote promising candidates to follow up on with wet lab experiments. So if it is at the beginning of you know, some, let's say, process for discovering new drugs, for the statistical side, maybe you know, we have some huge number of possibilities between chemical molecules, right? And we just want to sort of screen these 20,000 drug candidates to a smaller set so that on those smaller sets, you know, we have the resources to run wet lab experiments on each of them and actually you know, confirm whether they are relevant for some you know, medical intervention. So if what we care about is finding some promising set of these drug candidates, then it's not a matter of not making any, any false discoveries in the screening process. Maybe we are happy with uh, a false discovery rate of 20%. We just want this, this set of promising candidates that we get from this process, we want 80% of them to be relevant. And, it's, and, and we tolerate 20% false discovery. So in this case, uh, we want some alpha of 20%, and we want the false discovery rate to be bounded by alpha. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a procedure for this. The procedure is actually somewhat similar to Holmes correction. So we need to, so the benjamini hockberg procedure, first we need to sort p-values. So these are still you know, M tests. We have their p-values. So we sort the p-values to p1, p2, all the way to pm. Now they, that they are sorted, we're going to find maximum index in here for which the p-value let's say um, p sub 
j is still less than alpha over m times j. So very similar to the previous idea. Now instead of decrementing the denominator, we're multiplying j to the numerator. So again, we start with something like alpha over m, because j is 1 at the beginning of the process. right? And then when we find this index um, for all indices i less than or equal to j, we reject uh, h0 superscript i. And this method guarantees that false discovery rate is less than alpha. So the proof is, is, is more involved than you know, the previous uh, proof we had like for Bonfroni and so on. Um, but uh, this is the method that we need to follow. So to give you an example of how this works, so let's say the x-axis represents index, and the y-axis represents these sorted p-values. So um, if the p-values, uh, let's say we have m tests. So here we have m. There are m p-values. Um, these p-values could be something like this. If you have like many, many tests, something like this. So I just need a bit more curvature here. So I guess this would do the job. So uh, here with Benjamin Hochberg, well, let me first give you an example with Bonferroni and, and Holmes method. With Bonferroni, it's something like this. There is just some horizontal line that is equal to alpha over m. And then for most of these tests, they will be above this line, and we fail to reject them. So we're going to reject this, this, and this. So this method is, is Bonferroni. Holmes method is not just one line. It starts from the same place, right? It starts from the same place, but then it you know, goes up. It goes up because we're changing that baseline as well. And as it goes up, there would be also some p-values that are between these two lines. And that's the difference between Holm and Bonfroni. So this is Holm, right? Um, but this FDR method um, is usually for situations where m is so large that with Holm or Bonfroni, we cannot reject any of the null hypothesis, actually. So if you are trying to be you know, too conservative with this idea of finding promising candidates, just m is so large that when we start by you know, dividing alpha by 20,000, that baseline on the right-hand side becomes so tiny that no p-value is less than that. So then we, we, we're not going to have any like, candidates for follow-up with lab experiments. So now um, with, with the benjamin Hockberg procedure, what we do is you know, we have this line. So this is essentially j. Uh, we have some line with a slope of, we have some line with a slope of alpha over, over m, right? Because the x-axis here is j. And then based on how this line intersects with that sort of you know, trend of the, these data points of p-values, we're going to see the maximum index where the p-value is below the line is this. Then for all of these indices, for all of these, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And for everything, you know, also this includes the one here, then for everything else, we fail to reject. So interestingly, for these ones, we also reject. That's how we manage to reject more null hypotheses. Because sometimes, initially, m is so large that with Bonfroni or Holm, we're not going to reject anything. But this method later on becomes you know, less, uh, I guess, less conservative. And we may have this point here. And because of this point, we can say that if we reject all of these, there's only 20% of them that are false rejection because alpha in here is 20%. Questions? So this method has a different guarantee. It is not about family-wise error rates anymore. Uh, with this method, we get the false, false discovery rate being above, uh, sorry, false discovery rate being bounded by, um, by alpha, which is like 20%, which means that uh, precision so I'm just trying to convert it in computer science language. Essentially, we have a lower bound for precision. We just say that our, we want a process for this where the precision is not less than 80%. That's the same thing. So FDR, I guess, is, is, is a new concept for, for some of us. 
Uh, we have it in the confusion matrix. If you check the Wikipedia page of confusion matrix, you see FDR. And FDR is nothing other than one minus precision. So when we say we want a max uh, upper bound for FDR, that's the same thing as saying some lower bound for precision. We just don't want to be too imprecise. With whole? Uh, oh, they are very different. So with whole, um, with whole, we only reject what is below the line. So I mean, actually, the, the proper shape that shows three of them for the same data set uh, is something like this. For the same data set, uh, let's say, well, Bonfroni is very conservative. It's something here. Then whole starts conservative and becomes like, this is whole. And then, well, FDR, uh, well, I mean, th these things, they start from, they start from um, like 5% uh, over M or something like that. Now I can see that the notation in the textbook is better than the notation I used because now, I'm, now it's difficult to explain what's going on. With FDR, we start with something like 20% over M. So we start higher up. And then, and then we, have a, uh, we have a line with a, with a slope of something like 20% over M. Yeah, because here the index is J, and these are the p-values. So what happens for, for small m? For small m, uh, I guess there are some p-values that end up here. There could be some p-values that end up between Bonfroni and Holm. Uh, so with those methods, which are about family-wise error rates, we can only reject three. But, but with FDR, we reject much, much more. So with FDR, maybe we reject eight, so more than two times. And also in cases where M is large, this leads to no discovery. This leads to no discovery. So then our only hope is to have some discovery with Benjamin Hochberg uh, with some reasonable value of uh, Q or alpha. Yeah, so the thing is, so in your textbook, uh, Q is used for this. Alpha is used for this. But I was trying to make it easier. Uh, so, that, uh, so that you see some similarities between these, these uh, methods. So the thing is, here it's about alpha over m, alpha over m, and uh, decrementing the denominator. And then um, that one is also about alpha over m and incrementing the numerator. I mean, I don't, I don't say it's incrementing. It's just uh, increasing the coefficient in the numerator in increments of 1. Right? You just make the numerator larger. With Holm, you make the denominator smaller. Other questions? So one important consideration is that these guarantees are different. So um, that's why we need, we need these methods. Like FDR is not superior to the other methods. It's just a more uh, contemporary approach to this idea of multiple testing. Because maybe you know, a few decades ago, M, it was unusual to have M being you know, 10,000 or 100,000. Because just measuring things were more difficult. We never had that many data to conduct 10,000 tests. But now, I mean, just with the example of Bilko sponsorship, you saw that it's actually super easy to have uh, tens of thousands of uh, hypothesis tests. Um, and then if we, if we don't control for the family-wise error rate, uh, then, um, well, the result of our statistical process is, uh, is prone to error. Whether that error is acceptable or not, we don't know, because we don't know the ground truth. So the thing is, in the case of, uh, in the case of fund managers, where is it? Um, yeah, in the case of fund managers, Holm and, um, and without correction, they led to the same thing because we only rejected H01 and H03. Here, our estimate of how high the error can be is 22%. This is the same thing, but with a better guarantee. The result is the same. So now let's just try this fund manager with uh, false discovery rates. Of course, it doesn't really make sense in the context of fund managers if it is about you know, firing them, I guess. I guess controlling family-wise error rate is much, much more relevant than false discovery. Because false discovery is like, give me a set of fund managers, and I don't mind that 20% of them are just, their performance is equivalent to randomly picking stocks, right? So with Benjamin Hochberg, what happens is that uh, for the, well, we have the same p-values, right? So 006, uh, well, we need to, we compare it to this, we compare it to 1% and it's smaller, then the next one uh, is 0, 1, 2. We compare it to 5% uh, divide, uh, we compare it to actually 1% times 2. 
and it is, it is still smaller, then the third one uh, is not smaller. The third one is this. We need to compare it to 3%. And it's, it's larger. Therefore, the index J, the largest index for which p-value is smaller than the threshold, J is 2. Therefore, the outcome is the same as, uh, as Holm and as having no correction. So when J is 2, we reject H01 and H03. And this guarantees that FDR um, is bounded by 5%. If, if we want 5%. But here, of course, we can also run Benjamin Hockberg with a larger threshold and see what happens. With 5%, the result is the same. So uh, you can see the result of this, this, and this are the same. This is when we totally disregard what we learned today. This is when we try Holm, and we get this guarantee. This is when we try Bonfroni, try Benjamin Hockberg, and we get this guarantee. Um, and this is when we try some conservative and simple idea that 99% of people use. So I guess these two are the way to go. Other questions? All right, thank you very much, and see you next week.